Dr. Fizz, orthogonal functions in theoretical physics, which we need for our study of Fourier series. We're going to use the convention that all of our periodic waves have wavelengths equal to 2 pi. So we have the sine, the square, the triangle, and the sawtooth or a ramp. And you already have seen how conceptually you can get a square wave using sines by Fourier's theorem, which states that you start out with all of the uh, sine waves that go with that family, the family of that periodic wave. So you match the first frequency and then, or first wavelength, and then the second one is double the uh, frequency, triple the frequency. Here I have phases included in case that we have to shift some before we add a more general case. You have to do that with the triangle wave, by the way. And then I add a constant that allows me to lift or lower the function. And I cash in my phases so I have this a sub n instead with cosines. So this is an alternate general form that you can use instead of this one. So we'll use this lower one here. And it'd be nice to have a way to pull off those constants these coefficients which are made based on the periodic wave that you're trying to match. Uh, for example, suppose we have a vector instead of a function and we have some vector sum over here instead of functions we have these unit vectors and these coefficients need to be found. There's a neat way to isolate each one it's by the dot product i hat dot i hat will isolate that a sub x and over on this side using it with a specific uh, vector you get three. Does something like that exist for functions? The answer is yes and I'm going to use quantum mechanics here as the inspiration to, s to see that that would be the case. When we looked at quantum mechanics earlier with eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, the eigenspinners were orthogonal to each other. Might that apply to eigenfunctions? Well here is the uh, set of eigenfunctions for the infinite square well I'm going to show you that these are orthogonal with the definition of taking psi star psi and integrating uh, over all the x. You'll get 1 if you have the same function and if you have different functions you'll get 0. So to adapt this problem to our 2 pi interval notice that the first wavelength is 1 half of a wave fitted to L and if one half a wave is fitted to L, so your full wavelength here is 2L. So if a half a wave is fitted to L, L is lambda 1 over 2, and if you uh, divide by L and flip it, you'll have 2 over lambda 1. And then our convention is to make that 2 pi, so we have this neat uh, series um, of functions. And these wave functions are orthogonal, which is what we're going to show you. Before we do that, let's uh, do this. In fact, they're going to be orthonormal. So if you take one with itself, you get one. So that's a normalized um, a set of eigenfunctions. So to do this integral, we need to integrate the sine squared one. So we'll do that using the Euler formula. Here's the forward Euler formula and the backward one. Whenever you express the cosines and sines in terms of the exponentials, that's called the backward Euler formula. Here, if I write this with the negative i theta, since the sine is an odd function, it has a minus sign here, cosine is even function, I have to worry about the minus sign. Subtracting the lower one from the top one, you get 2i sine theta, and if I divide by a 2i, I have by sine theta. Put in nx, and then square it, and we're ready to do our integral. When we square this, we get e to the 2i nx, and similarly, for this last part squared, we get the 2 up there. For the cross term, you multiply these exponentials, you get 1, uh, but then there's a 2 and a minus sign, so it's minus 2, and the denominator has to be squared, which gives you a minus 4. I'm going to show you that this first integral is 0, and that will show you that the second one is over the far right here, this last one is 0, because uh, there is plus or minus this exponential, it's not going to matter. And then we'll have to do this middle integral, which is 1 half, to do that integral. So here's the, uh, the, the proof here to show you that you get 0 uh, for the e to the 2i nx. When you integrate that, you, you have e to the 2i nx over 2i n. If you take the derivative to go backwards, you'd pull down to 2i n, it would cancel this, and you would get that over here on the left. And evaluate that at the various limits here, two limits. I use the forward Euler formula to write the, cap, the cosine and the sine here with the i, and I put in the pi wherever there is x 
and put in negative pi wherever there is x and subtract. Notice that the cosine being an even function, I can throw the minus sign away. For the sine, which is an odd function, I must put the minus sign out in front. Now this is zero. Why? Because I have cosine something here minus cosine the same thing. So I have something minus something. So they're set the same. They're gone. For the sine, they're individually gone because the sine of 2 pi is 0, the sine of 4 pi is 0, the sine of 3 pi is 0. These are going to always be 0, always 0. So we get zip. And you can use the same logic and trace through these steps with the minus sign. It won't change anything. You'll get 0 again. So I need to integrate this middle one, which is 1 half. So integrating the 1 half, I get x over 2. And that's going to be pi minus a negative pi, which is going to be 2 pi over 2 is pi. And the normalization constant has to be 1 over square root of pi. So when I integrate this, this a squared is 1 over pi. This will integrate to pi, and pi over pi is 1. What about when they're different? When they're different, they're going to be 0. And that's the secret to understanding how this Fourier series is going to work, the procedure. So how do we do this uh, product here? Well, if they're different, we'll have, using the backward Euler formula for the signs, we'll have this arrangement. And notice that since they're different, the cross terms, everything here, is going to be of the form e to the ipx. Since n and m are different, you will not get any you know, cancellations uh, here. You'll get simply some integer up here, p. Well, if that's the case, then I'm going to get 0, because I've shown you before how this works. You get cosine of px plus i sine of px. Evaluate at these limits. When you put in for the uh, x for the pi with a cosine term, and the lower limit here, since cosine's even, you'll subtract the same thing from the same thing, basically, and get zero. And when you work with the signs individually, each sign of p times pi is going to be zero. Sine of pi, sine of 2 pi, sine of 3 pi, they're all zero. So in summary, we get this nice orthogonality condition, which is here, if you uh, were to uh, divide by that pi and put a square root of pi under each of these, we would say it's then orthonormal, which is what you have in quantum mechanics. You have orthonormal. But here we're happy with this. The fact that you basically uh, kill it off if it's not the same, if n's not equal to m, we're in business. And we'll see how to use this in the next section when we get into the Fourier series.